All right, this is going to be a fun chapter. We're going to talk about viruses. Viruses are unique little organisms, and it's probably not even accurate to call them organisms, but uh, I'm probably going to do it anyway. So maybe you want to take that with a little grain of salt, okay? Um, but let me talk about a few of the facts that we know about organisms, uh, excuse me, viruses. Um, so they infect every type of known cell. So they'll infect bacteria, uh, algae, fungi, protozoa, plants, and of course animals, but we generally only think of them as infecting uh, usually people, but also animals. Um, but they, they literally will infect anything. Um, and that word infect is even maybe a little bit misleading because they don't necessarily always cause harm. So it's interesting. Um, so s just to give you an idea of how prevalent they are and how small they are, seawater can contain 10 million viruses per milliliter, which is a, a cubic centimeter. So these things are small. So for a long time, people knew that there was something going on um, with some diseases that were being caused by different organisms, they just didn't know what it what was causing it. Um, they could see cells in a microscope, but they they couldn't tell or figure out why certain uh, organisms were dying or, or getting sick. Um, Louis Pasteur was the first person to come up with the idea that there was some living thing causing these diseases that was smaller than um, uh, bacteria. And the term that he proposed was virus, which is Latin for the word poison. So we know it's literally not a poison, um, but the name has stuck. So once this uh, theory was postulated, people began to try to uh, actually prove that there was uh, such a thing as a uh, something smaller than a cell causing an infection. And so these people, who I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce their names, uh, discovered that, or at least proved that viruses were causing disease in tobacco. Uh, these two people here uh, discovered the foot and mouth disease in cattle. And this term filterable virus was coined. And what this term means is researchers knew that they could filter out bacteria, but they knew something was getting through because they could filter it and it would still, uh, they could then take whatever the uh, liquid was that filtered through and put new cells in there or an organism and prove that uh, whatever was causing the infection was able to get through the filter. And so it almost seems like a misnomer because filterable to me sounds like it's that you're filtering it out. Um, but what it apparently means is that it actually goes through the filter. So again, that's what I pretty much just said. So earlier I had mentioned that it's questionable whether these things are organisms. I guess it depends on your definition. Um, the reason why I say that is because it's arguable whether these things, viruses, are alive or dead. Again, it depends on the definition you use. Um, most people agree uh, that they are not alive um, because Viruses are unable to replicate themselves without a host, all right? And so by most people's definition, if an organism can somehow procreate, then it's considered to be alive. Um, and so since they can't, then they're not considered to be living things by most people. And so what they have decided is to call these things infectious molecules, which, I mean, that's a stretch too, because there's several molecules. Um, and, and some of these viruses are 
extremely complex. Um, some are very simple. So, you know, I guess there's just really no good way to describe them. Um, but rather than calling them alive or dead, they can be described as active or inactive. I know that doesn't help a lot. So apparently, viruses have really shaped the way animals have evolved um, by influencing their genes for a couple of reasons. Um, one, and we'll discuss this later, is that they can actually uh, place their genetic material in the DNA of the host. Um, another way is that hosts have uh, needed to adapt in order to survive the infection created by viruses. And so two completely different ways that uh, evolution um, has been influenced by viruses um, yeah, of all different types of uh, organisms. So it's estimated that about 10% of the human genome contains sequences that came from viruses. And it's probably worth mentioning right now that those uh, sequences that are added into the human genome could be uh, detrimental. Uh, they could uh, actually be positive changes, um, meaning it helps the animal to uh, adapt to their environment better. Um, or they could be just inconsequential, just neither good nor bad. So 10 to 20% of bacterial DNA contains viral sequences for the same reasons. So one thing about viruses that's, that we had mentioned earlier, and this is just the fancy term for it, is they're obligate intracellular parasites. What that means is the parasite we know from last chapter means that they, they have to have a host and obligate means that, uh, well, same thing basically, they, they can't reproduce any other way. Um, I guess that's, you know, there are parasites that are not obligate parasites. They can reproduce outside of a host. Um, viruses can't. And intracellular, we know intra means within and of course the cell. So they're parasites that have to have a host and they have to be inside of the cell. So this table in your book just gives a quick synopsis and we're gonna discuss some of this in detail later on, but let's just run through it. So I already said this, they're obligate intracellular parasites of these types of organisms. Um, ubiquitous, which just means they're everywhere um, and have had a major uh, impact on development, you know, evolutionarily. Um, that's supposed to say ultra microscopic with an L there because you can't see them with a normal microscope because they're 20 nanometers um, up to 450 nanometers um, in size. They're not cells. Um, they do have a structure that might sort of resemble cells in certain cases, but we'll show that they are not actually cells. They don't have organelles or anything like that. Um, don't independently fulfill the characteristics of life, which we men mentioned earlier. Um, inactive macromolecules, when they are not in a host, they don't do anything, and they are only activated once they're in a host. So the basic structure of these organisms um, is a protein shell, which we call a capsid, with uh, some sort of um, nuclear material inside. The nuclear material can be DNA or RNA, uh, but not both. And they can be double-stranded or single-stranded, both RNA and DNA. Molecules are very specific to which kind of a cell that they can infect. That's why you know there are certain animal viruses that don't infect humans and vice versa. Um, and that's because of the molecules on the surface of the virus. Um, the way they multiply is by essentially hijacking the um, methods for DNA replication in the host and they just hop on board the assembly line and uh, create a copy of themselves. Um, they don't have enzymes for most metabolic processes that's why they have to use the enzymes of the host and they lack the 
again, the machinery for creating their own proteins. So again, they, they piggyback on the host cell's ability to do that. So viruses are unique in their classification. They don't follow the same classification system that we've used up to this point um, because phylogenetically they don't, they're not part of any of the um, genetic line uh, of archaea, prokaryotes, or eukaryotes. So completely different uh, classification system. So animal viruses used to be classified based on what they infected and what disease they, they caused. Um, but they've gotten a little more uh, specific in how we classify them um, because there were some issues with overlap and uh, actual molecular makeup of these things. So we still do classify them on the hosts and the diseases they cause. But we also have to add in the structure, which before, you know, I mean, it hasn't been very long that we've even known what the structure of these things were. Um, also, the chemical composition, same things, and uh, similarities in their genetics. Again, stuff that they didn't know up until just the last, you know, few years within my lifetime. Um, and, and probably some of your lifetimes. So we have this International Committee on the Taxonomy. Of viruses and that's how they actually de determine how to classify these things um, so what they've decided is there are three orders 73 families and 283 genera of viruses and I'm going to make you learn every single one of those I'm just kidding which of the following best describes viruses heterotrophic saprobic obligate intracellular parasites, and chemoautotrophic or photosynthetic. So as we mentioned earlier in this chapter, the answer is obligate intracellular parasites. All right, so this picture right here is really trying to illustrate by comparison the size of viruses. So everything from here down this line are all viruses, all right? So this is Rickettsia, uh, Bacterium, Bacillus. It's uh, This is Streptococcus, Bacillus, um, at, and there's different sizes, but average one micrometer. Um, E. coli, uh, two microns, um, a yeast cell down here, seven microns, and this would be a bud of the yeast cell, I think. Um, but anyway, this just shows a lot of these. Um, example, so here's some that you probably heard of, rabies virus, 125 nanometers, um, herpes virus, 150 nanometers, polio, 30 nanometers. Oh, and this, I just realized, is actually a hemoglobin molecule, so this is not a virus down here. This is the molecule that uh, obviously carries oxygen on your red blood cell. So these things are the smallest infectious agents that we know of. That I don't think that's exactly true, now that I think about it. Uh, because we do have prions. I can't remember if we discussed that already or if we're discussing it later, um, but something to keep in mind. Um, 2,000 viruses can fit into an average bacterium. So the smallest virus viruses are parvoviruses. If I heard of parvo in a, in a dog, you have to get them vaccinated for that. And those things are about 20 nanometers in diameter. Remember, a nanometer is a millionth of a meter. The largest viruses are these mimiviruses, which you can see a picture of one right there, uh, about 450 nanometers in diameter. Um, some cylindrical viruses, 
can be up to 800 nanometers long, but they're only 15 nanometers wide. And as I mentioned before, we didn't know what these things were shaped like until we had the invention of the uh, electron microscope. All right, time to talk about the uh, structure of these viruses. So capsids, nucleic acids, and envelopes we're going to discuss over the next few, uh, several slides here. So it says that viruses bear no resemblance to cells. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, you know, here's a couple of different types of viruses here. Um, this is an enveloped virus. It's got a membrane around it. It's got some genetic material inside. So, I mean, it resembles it a little bit, but you just notice there's no organelles, and certainly the... Uh, this outer uh, membrane is significantly different from um, a cell, um, but the actual envelope part of it, it, I mean, it's fairly similar because it actually comes from the cell. That's how it actually gets on there. So anyway, um, but certainly there's a lot of differences, okay? So as we mentioned, they don't have any method to synthesize their own proteins, so they have to piggyback. Um, the structure of the outside of these things is regular repeating subunits to create some sort of a, not really a polymer, um, but a crystalline structure. And, and if you know what a crystal is, it's a very uniform uh, structure in the way the um, molecules or atoms are arranged. And that I guess this is sort of a side note, but that, that, that's what gives uh, um, certain things like glass um, or crystals um, that transparent appearance because when they're uniformly spaced like that, it allows light to pass through. Um, that's neither here nor there with this. But anyway, you can see uh, that this... Uh, this is, this is called an icosahedron. It's just a 20-sided shape. Um, this structure on the outside, uh, or not, yeah, sided. So there's no wasted uh, energy with these viruses. Um, they only have what is needed to get their genetic material inside of the host cell, which is an external coating, which they attach to the host cell with, um, one or more strands of nuclear material of either DNA or RNA and occasionally there will be one or two enzymes in them. Alright, so let's look at a virus here diagrammed out. So the covering consists of a capsid and some contain what is called an envelope. Inside we're going to have some sort of nuclear material of either DNA or RNA and some will have enzymes um, that we'll discuss a little bit later. Okay, so all viruses have a capsid, and the capsid that we're looking at is this 20-sided icosahedron right here that you see in both of these, okay? Um, that's what we're talking about here. So it's also called a shell, and it is a, a protein structure that surrounds the nucleic acid. They call it a nucleocapsid when it's together with the um, uh, genetic material, the nucleic acid. Um, so this right here would be considered a nucleocapsid, which is basically, as far as I can tell, um, is just saying a virus. Okay, um, Naked viruses, which is what we're looking at on the left side there of that picture, only has a nucleocapsid. It doesn't have an envelope. Okay, So the envelope is this structure on the outside here, um, which covers the nucleocapsid. Um, so in the case of a naked virus, the nucleocapsid is the virus. In the case of an enveloped virus, the nucleocapsid is inside the envelope of the virus. So this whole thing is the virus. Um, so it says usually a modified piece of the host cell membrane, and we'll show you how that actually gets around this a little bit later. It just basically pulls a piece of the uh, cell membrane off of the host cell as it leaves. So sticking off of some of these, well, not some, but all of these viruses, we have these structures called spikes. It seems like it should be a little more uh, scientific word than that, but that's what they're called. 
So they come off of either the envelope or the nucleocapsid, um, either naked or enveloped viruses. So here's the spikes on this um, enveloped virus and this little thing up here, these are all on every single corner um, of this icosahedral shape is the spike of a naked virus. So what they do is they are the little um, attachment points for the virus. So the term virus includes any stage of the virus. The term virion is a fully for formed or mature virus that is ready to be able to infect a host. So the capsid is, as I said, the outside part, the most prominent feature of the viruses because they're, they're all very unique to the shape, uh, or the shape is unique to each virus. Um, so they're composed of these uh, subunits, these pieces called capsomeres. And what happens is these capsomeres will actually uh, form bonds with each other automatically. And so they self-assemble by sticking to themselves. Um, so there's two different types of capsids. There's helical and then there's icosahedral and as I should told you this is the icosahedral shape here. And we I'll show you the uh, helical ones a little bit later. Um, enveloped viruses as I said usually take a bit of the cell membrane of the host cell when they leave. Um, so they can come from the cell membrane or they can come from the nuclear envelope or they can come from the endoplasmic reticulum of the host cell. So, but remember, all of these are phospholipid bilayers, so they end up having a phospholipid bilayer envelope around them when they're finished. So the differences, that, you know, as I said, that it comes from the host membrane, but there are some significant differences because the proteins that are on the membrane of a um, of the host cell get replaced with viral proteins and that is a good thing um, because that's how we can recognize these viruses as being foreign because they don't have the same uh, antigens as the host cell which hopefully they never develop the uh, methods to do that because they will be invisible to us essentially and until they actually in, uh, infect a cell and then they, they can self-destruct. Uh, but anyway, some envelope proteins attach to the capsid proteins. And then of course, another difference is um, on an envelope, we have these spikes, right? Um, another thing that's important to understand is these enveloped viruses are what we call pleomorphic. You've heard that word before, pleomorphism. It just means that they don't have a set uh, shape because they're not rigid like the capsid is. And they can be uh, all kinds of different shapes from spherical to filamentous. And I'm going to show you some of those right now. So figure or table 5-2 in your book. So this right here is uh, a naked virus. Um, and this is the helical form. Um, helix means twist, and so this structure is 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 um, twisted around it, it's like almost like a, a screw around the nuclear material. And what they're showing here is the tobacco mosaic virus, which um, infects a tobacco plant. So this right here is an enveloped virus that is um, also helical. So essentially we take this structure here and we put an envelope around it. So you can see that structure on the inside here and then this is the envelope. These green things are the spikes that stick off of it. Um, icosahedral capsids, this is a naked icosahedral capsid it doesn't look as easy to see, um, but essentially every three of these creates a triangle, and that would be one of the 20 sides right there. So this is a denovirus. Uh, each little corner where each spike sticks off is called the vertex, which just means corner. 
And if there's 20 sides, that means there's 12 corners. And each one of these sides is called a capsomer. And as it says here, the number of capsomers can actually uh, vary from virus to virus. So poliovirus has 32, adenovirus 252. So here is an example of an enveloped icosahedron. Actually, two, hepatitis B on the left and herpes simplex virus on the right. So the blue part here is the capsid, and then the envelope is out here on the outside, and this red part is where the nuclear material is. Now, we also have these very complex capsids. And this is example an example of a T4. Um, T2 bacteriophages look the same. Um, these are viruses that infect bacteria and we'll actually discuss uh, the life cycle and how these uh, are or how these infect bacteria in just a few slides here. Okay, so let's talk about the nuclear material. So viruses have either DNA or RNA, but they never have both. Um, compared to other animals, viral genes are really, really small. Um, in fact, for example, in the hepatitis B virus, there's only four genes, where remember humans have, oh gosh, what is it, 30,000 genes, maybe? Um, so some of them can have hundreds, like in the herpes viruses, but still, relatively speaking, that's, that's very, very, very small. Um, because they only have the genes that are needed to be able to uh, in, infect a cell and, and cause it to replicate it. So the actual nucleic acid uh, varies dr drastically from virus to virus, okay? So they can be either DNA or RNA, but there can also be differences among them. So DNA can exist as either single-stranded DNA viruses, um, just one strand, and we denote it with two small s's just uh, for single-stranded uh, DNA. Double-stranded is DSDNA. Um, they can be linear. Um, the DNA can, or it can be uh, wrapped into a circle, but you only see circular DNA in the double-stranded. RNA viruses can also be double-stranded, um, but they're usually single-stranded. Uh, the term positive sense RNA is RNA that's ready to be translated into a protein, because remember that's how we make a protein. So this thing will hop onto a ribosome and the, the host cell will actually uh, translate the protein from the viral DNA sequence. Um, don't, and this isn't to be confused with positive polarity or negative polarity. Um, there's not a good enough explanation for that in your book or for that matter anywhere else I could find that I felt comfortable with uh, explaining what that is. So we're going to kind of stay away from the polarity part of this. Um, but anyway, so negative sense RNA has to be converted to positive sense before it can be translated. So RNA genomes can be segmented, meaning they're actually actual, uh, that should say RNA. Let me fix that. Ta-da. Um, and a group of viruses called retroviruses actually do carry their own enzymes so that they can make DNA out of their RNA. Um, but as we've said many times, most viruses do not have their own enzymes. And we'll discuss retroviruses in a little more detail later. All right, so we said that viruses are very simple and they don't have a lot of extra things in them, but they do have some things. Um, some of them have enzymes. And these enzymes, um, we just mentioned one of them, um, are used for the specifics of, the, uh, of what needs to go on in that particular um, virus or host cell. Um, an example of a virus is called a polymerase. And polymerases, um, usually when you see ACE on the end of something, it's a virus, uh, excuse me, enzyme. Um, but, and polymer, it makes a polymer, which uh, DNA and RNA are polymers, right? So these things are enzymes that create polymers. So they synthesize the DNA and the RNA. 
um, replicases, replicate um, RNA or copy the RNA. Uh, reverse transcriptase um, creates a piece of DNA from RNA. So it uses it and creates a, sort of a mirror image of the RNA molecule aside from uh, using a, a T instead of a U, right? Thymine instead of uracil. Uh, five, table 5.3 five, in your book just kind of gives some examples of some of these different types of DNA and RNA viruses that we've just discussed. So take a minute and look through that on your own. Which of the following is not a type of viral nucleic acid? Single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, double-stranded DNA, segmented RNA, or all of the above? And the, exam uh, the answer is all. All right, so let's talk about how these things actually replicate themselves. So as it says, they're really tiny parasites that hijack um, the machinery of the host cell to synthesize proteins and replicate their genetic material. So the nature of the viral replication dictates the way the virus is transmitted and what it does to the cell, um, the responses of the immune defenses of the host, and the way humans attempt to uh, fight the infection off, meaning what types of medications and whatnot that, or treatments that we use. And this is talking about medically. Okay, so there's uh, a few basic steps, uh, either five or six, depending on how you number these things. Um, you might see it five, you might see it six, because for whatever reason, your book sometimes uh, puts um, penetration and uncoating together. So whatever, five or six. Um, but here they are. Adsorption, which notice that's a D, not a B. Penetration, uncoating, synthesis, assembly, and then release. Okay, and we're going to go through each one of those um, in detail here as, as these slides go on. Um, so the length of replication of a virus varies from about eight hours, and in, in, an example is poliovirus, to about 36 hours um, in like a herpes virus. Okay, so adsorption with a D, not a B. Um, this is essentially sticking to the host cell. All right, so it has to be a host cell that it fits with. It's got to have the, the correct uh, connectors to be able to stick to it. And that is what we call the host range. So not every virus can infect every type of cell or, or every type of organism. And so the host range is the range that uh, it is limited to that it can infect. So they can be... Uh, very, very restrictive, meaning just a narrow host, or very broadly restrictive, meaning there's a huge number of hosts or different types of cells that they can infect. Uh, hepatitis B only infects the liver cells of humans. Poliovirus um, can infect the intestinal and the nerve cells of all primates, um, or at least a lot of primates. Uh, rabies infects different cells, all kinds of cells, in all mammals. So hepatitis B would be highly restrictive, poliovirus moderately restrictive, and rabies would be broadly restrictive. And that's why a dog and a human um, can both get rabies virus. Okay, so cells that don't have the correct um, receptors won't connect to the spikes on the, the virus and they will not be infected by the virus. The term tropisms is the uh, 
specificity that a virus has for specific for certain tissues so um, as we said hepatitis b only infects the liver cells of a human and so what this picture is showing here is on the inside these little red you, it's hard to see but there's little red half circles here those are specific to these red you know dome shaped spikes um, and you can see that this green one over here would not attach to here and this red one would not attach to here and so these receptors on this host cell would attach to this uh, naked virus because the spikes would actually connect into these things all right so table 5.4 in your book just goes through the basic life cycle of a virus so right here is this is showing adsorption which is number one right up here and this is when the spikes attach to the receptors of the cell which are usually a glycoprotein which is what the um, um, antigens usually are made out of and the spikes are also usually a glycoprotein as well There are two mechanisms by which enveloped viruses enter host cells. In one of the mechanisms, the virion attaches to host cell receptors by specific proteins on its surface, called spikes. The envelope of the virus fuses with the plasma membrane of the host, and the nucleocapsid is released directly into the cytoplasm. The nucleic acid then separates from the protein coat. In the second mechanism, the enveloped virus adsorbs to the host cell by specific proteins on its surface, and the virion is taken in by endocytosis. In this process, the host cell plasma membrane surrounds the whole virion and forms a vesicle. The envelope of the virion then fuses with the plasma membrane of the vesicle, and the nucleocapsid is released into the host cytoplasm. The capsid protein is then removed, releasing the nucleic acid of the virus. A naked virion also enters by endocytosis. Since the virus has no envelope, it cannot fuse with the plasma membrane. After being engulfed, the viral nucleic acid is released from the endocytic vesicle. The nucleic acid then separates from the capsid. All right, so step number two is penetration, which is just uh, bringing the virus or nuclear material inside of the cell. So this picture over here to the right shows endocytosis. So there's two methods, as the video just said, endocytosis, which is where the entire virus is engulfed by the cell and it creates a vacuole or a vesicle. Um, I call these things uh, vacuoles. I think vesicle is, is wrong. Um, but I could be wrong. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so this vacuole comes in, and you can see that this, and this is the same virus. It's not four different viruses. It's just four different steps. Uh, but this right here is uh, shows that the uh, the invo or the piece of the cell membrane um, that was right here is now around the uh, virus. And then what happens is it opens up, and then um, the capsid breaks open, and the nuclear material which in this case is DNA is released out into the cell um, the other way is direct fusion and by the way endocytosis remember can be a naked or um, an enveloped cell or virus direct fusion can only be an enveloped virus because it has to have an envelope to 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 become part of the plasma membrane Otherwise, there's nothing to fuse, because that's what that means. We're fusing the envelope of the virus with the cell membrane of the host cell. Um, so the flu virus um, and the mumps viruses uh, penetrate this way. So as I said, the envelope merges with the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, and it releases the nucleocapsid inside of the cell's interior. Uncoating is when you take the coating off. Um, so enzymes inside the vacuole dissolve the envelope and the capsid, and, and it's interesting because this is in an attempt to destroy the virus, but what it actually does is it releases the virus. It's kind of like those shows where you see someone trying to defuse a bomb and they 
you know, cut the red wire and rather than diffusing the bomb, it just makes the countdown go faster, right? To blow up faster. Um, so the virus fuses with the wall of the vesicle and the viral nucleic acid is released into the cytoplasm where it can then be um, replicated. So what we just talked about is number two on this picture here. So you can see that um, this picture here is showing endocytosis, right? Because we have a vacuole that is produced and created. And then, um, so this is the penetration part here. And then this right here is the uncoating part because you can see here's the RNA on the inside of this virus. And then now it's been released out. So the next step, which is four by my count so far, is synthesis. So that's synthesizing um, proteins and more DNA. All right. So the way DNA viruses do it is they have to enter the nucleus of the host in order to be replicated because they, you don't replicate DNA outside of the nucleus. RNA viruses don't need to enter the DNA because where we uh, create proteins are out in the cytoplasm on a ribosome, right? And apparently they can produce RNA um, out there as well using uh, specific uh, replicase enzymes. Okay, uh, retroviruses, um, which is like HIV, turn their RNA into DNA. Um, in other words, they just copy it uh, into a piece of DNA. And they use the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So let's talk about double-stranded DNA viruses for a while. So they're divided into two parts. They have There's early phase double-stranded DNA viruses. And with those, the DNA of the virus uh, goes into the nucleus and they create mRNA. Um, then the mRNA moves out into the cytoplasm and uh, attaches to a ribosome. And it creates the enzymes needed to then go back and take the DNA from the virus and replicate it. Um, and that is done back in the, in the nucleus again. Um, it does use some of the host's um, enzymes as well, um, which is the DNA polymerase, which by the way is, is the enzyme that it uses to create a copy its own DNA during um, uh, interphase of mitosis and meiosis. Um, so the other type, so we said there's two parts of these double-stranded DNA viruses. The other one is the late phase viruses. Not, I shouldn't say, this isn't two different viruses. It's the same virus, it's two different phases of the double-stranded virus. So I don't know if I said that wrong or not. But anyway, during the late phase, what happens is we, uh, we build the other parts needed to make the virus. Because if we just put the parts back together, we only have, have enough parts for one virus. Um, so we need to build, you know, we might be able to produce hundreds of viruses, you know, in an, in an hour. So we're going to need to produce hundreds of capsids and, you know, m thousands of spikes and so on. And so that's what happens in the late phase. Um, also, during this late phase of synthesis, we actually put everything together into a virion. And the way the viruses are released is they are either released by budding, which is like exocytosis, um, or the cell just disintegrates and falls apart, and then they're released out into the interstitial fluid. Or in the case of a, a bacterium or whatever, they're just released outside of the cell. And hopefully there are other cells around it um, that it can infect. So one interesting little side note. Viral DNA can be integrated into the host DNA, and it says silently, and the reason why is because it doesn't necessarily do anything, um, or at least not for a long, long time. Um, and so you could be infected for, for years. Um, sometimes it can cause a tumor. There is certainly uh, a link between, for example, the human papillomavirus which causes warts, um, but specifically genital warts and cervical cancer in the uh, cervix of women 
on their uterus. All right, so step three and uh, let's. I guess I said step three earlier, but apparently this picture is putting step two. Um, that's right. It's putting penetration and uncoating as step two. So I misspoke. So step three then is what we just talked about: taking the uh, producing new spikes, producing new capsomeres, capsomeres, which are the sides of these icosahedral shapes, right? And then our new RNA that we've produced, and then it's putting them all together into a new virion or and it only shows one but remember I mean there's several so there's three pieces of DNA here so we're gonna at least make three virions right and so that would bring us to this assembly um, as we said earlier it puts all the parts together and so that's kinda what this is trying to show here so taking all these parts and then creating um, new viruses or virions and then the last thing we have to do is get this virus out of the cell so it can go and infect other cells so this can uh, be by the hundreds or or you know like every hour or minute I don't know but it's it can be a lot or not very many um, it just varies based on uh, the virus and the cells that are infected um, some of the things that control the release are the size of the virus, the health of the host cell, so example um, a pox virus like chicken pox can release 3,000 to 4,000 virions before the cell dies, um, polio virus can, uh, can release 100,000 virions before it dies. And so you can see with these numbers, I mean, these are just massive numbers, and so it doesn't take a, a ton of virions to be able to cause a, a massive infection very, very, very quickly. Okay, so on this picture then, this last step here is showing um, this is an enveloped virus, and the reason why we know that is because this right here, the nucleocapsid, um, you can see that it actually takes a piece of the nuclear membrane with it as it's um, exocytosed out of the cell. Um, now notice one thing, all of these spikes um, and different proteins on the surface of this don't look like the surface of the, of the cell membrane because what it does, it replaces the proteins on this cell membrane with different proteins including spikes on the envelope of the virus. We don't call it a cell membrane anymore because it's not a cell. But that's not the only way they're released and this is showing the exact same thing. Um, it's not, a, not an icosahedral virus. This is a, a helical virus um, but it does the same thing. You can see that it creates spikes on the, on the cell membrane surface and then it um, buds off, and we are now left with an or excuse me, a helical enveloped virus, and this is a colored electron microscope version of the same thing. Actually, probably not a, not an electron microscope. Enveloped viruses are usually released from the host cell by a budding mechanism. First, viral spike proteins are inserted into the host cell membrane. Next, the inside of the host cell membrane becomes coated with viral matrix protein. The viral capsid then becomes completely enclosed by the region of the cell membrane into which the spikes and matrix protein are embedded and the virus is released by budding. So how do these things uh, cause damage? Um, first of all, there's a name for that, and it's called cytopathic effects, or CPEs. So cyto means cell, path means disease. So in other words, it's how these things create disease. So it actually changes the appearance of these cells microscopically, and that's one of the ways they can um, determine an infection. 
But some examples of some of these cytopathic effects are changes to the shape and size of the infected cell, um, changes inside of the cell, um, the, uh, the addition of inclusion bodies, which are granular structures inside the cell um, of either masses of viruses, um, damaged organelles of the cells um, in either the nucleus or the cytoplasm of the cell. And then there are also these things called syncytia, which are these clumps. Well, it's like a, it's a massive cell that's made by taking several cells and, and putting them all together into one cell. And so you end up with several nuclei. Um, the, you've probably heard of RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, common uh, in little children and babies. Um, this creates syncytia. Or what I mean is RSV creates syncytia. So eventually, the damage that the virus creates will kill most cells. Um, however, some of them can uh, stay alive for, for long, long periods of time. And they call this a carrier relationship because it's carrying the virus without dying. Um, so that's called a persistent infection. So the cell harbors the virus, um, which means that it doesn't die immediately. And it can be for a few weeks um, to the rest of the life of the organism. So in these persistent infections, they can actually stay in the cytoplasm and be latent, meaning they're just not doing anything. They're just there, but they can become active for different reasons throughout the uh, um, life of the of the host. For example, chicken pox and oh, herpes simplex that causes cold sores. Those viruses live dormant in the ganglia of your nervous system, and then every so often they can become active again and you get a cold sore. Um, they never go away. Chicken pox, you get chicken pox, but then later on in life, the, the virus never goes away. And what happens is you can later on get infected with the same virus again. And generally, it, it's uh, manifested as what we call shingles. Um, sometimes you can get chicken pox again, meaning like a full-fledged chicken pox outbreak, but generally that doesn't happen. So a provirus is a virus that the DNA actually of the virus becomes part of the DNA of the host. Um, it can actually infect brain cells and stay there for the, the life of the host and, and just slowly create more and more damage to the brain and cause loss of function of the brain. Um, chronic latent state viruses as part of this persistent infection uh, heading are viruses that go into a period of inactivation and then later on uh, become active again. And uh, well, those are the uh, examples I had already given you, I guess. So how do viruses, how are they associated with cancer? You wouldn't think that they would be. Um, we do know that cancer is because of damage to the DNA, and we generally uh, talk about it in terms of some sort of uh, ionizing radiation or free radical damage or something like that, um, which is certainly true, but viruses can also create damage to the DNA that can cause the cell to uh, replicate without stopping, which is what, of course, creates a tumor, right? So ways that they can do this in animals is by uh, inserting genes into the DNA that, that actually cause a tumor to form. Or they can produce proteins in the cell that cause it to continue to replicate. An example of some, some cancer-causing virus, I had already given you this um, uh, example earlier, the human papillomavirus, um, which is warts, right? Um, Epstein-Barr virus, which actually causes uh, the kissing disease. Uh, what is it? Mono, mononucleosis. 
um, HTLV1 virus, which actually is related to the uh, HIV infection, human immunodeficiency. So the term we use for viruses that cause cancer are oncogenic. Onc means tumor and genic means to like generate sort of to create. So viruses that create cancer or cancer causing viruses. So up to 20% of human cancers uh, may be caused by viruses. They're still trying to figure that out. And the term that we use for the changes that happen to um, the cell because of an oncogenic virus is called transformation. Um, this can be alterations in chromosomes um, because of course that's usually what causes cancer, right? Um, it can cause an increase in the rate of growth. It can cause changes in the um, cell's surface molecules. And what it does is it causes it to divide for an indefinite period and that's what a tumor is. Normally our cells divide to a point and then they stop. Um, when, it, when they don't stop, they create a tumor. And that tumor then disrupts the normal metabolic activities of the human, uh, or, or any animal for that matter, and causes cancer. So oncoviruses are the viruses that actually can create a tumor. So what about viruses that infect bacteria? Um, these things are called bacteriophages or bacteriophages or just simply a phage. So they were discovered in 1915 by these two people. Um, the word phage means to eat or eating um, and that is a misnomer because there's nothing eating anything. The bacteria aren't eating the virus and the virus isn't eating the bacteria. Um, but apparently that's what they thought early on. So most of these bacteriophages are double-stranded DNA, um, but there are some RNA bacteriophages as well. But every bacterial species is parasitized by different bacteriophages. And oftentimes it actually makes the bacterium more pathogenic than it already is. So if you have a pathogenic bacterium, um, getting infected with a um, bacteriophage can actually make it more pathogenic. So T-even bacteriophages um, are a bacteriophage that infects the E. coli. So we mentioned the T4 um, virus earlier. I showed you a picture of it. And so that's an example of a T-even bacterium, or a virus, excuse me. Um, so let's go through that. So this is what a T-even bacteriophage looks like. So it has an icosahedral capsid head, this part right here. You can see that's the 20-sided shape that we've mentioned earlier. It's got a central tube that comes down off of it. Um, that is surrounded by a sheath, and at the, at the, um, at the top of the uh, tube, there's a, also a, a collar, and at the bottom there is this thing called a base plate right down here. Um, also, at the very bottom near the base plate, are the, or on the bottom of the base plate are these things called tail pins, these things that sh stick down inside of the uh, cell wall, um, and then fibers that look like legs that uh, help this thing attach to the uh, um, cell. And they look like some sort of weird little robot creature. So let's talk about how these things infect uh, a, an E. coli bacterium. So they, just like we've mentioned earlier in the phases of the infection of a virus, we start with adsorption, right? So they have to have the correct receptors. Um, what happens then is the tube actually penetrates and sticks through like a hypodermic needle the uh, cell wall and cell membrane um, or just the nuclear envelope or the envelope of the uh, bacterium and then it squirts its uh, nuclear material usually dna out okay so there's we skip the uncoating 
stage because there's nothing to uncoat. It injects the DNA naked into the host cell. So then, of course, it hijacks the um, machinery of the host for replication and synthesis of whatever it needs. And once those parts are all made, they spontaneously assemble into new virions, right? New bacteriophages. So the um, average sized E. coli cell can have up to about 200 of these phage units. Um, and then eventually what happens is the cell explodes or lyses, and this is called the lytic phase or the lytic cycle, and that's what releases these new bacteriophages out to infect new cells. And that lysis is actually sped up because of enzymes produced um, from the viral uh, instructions that cause the uh, cell envelope to get weak and, and explode. And as I said, then it will go through and infect other uh, viruses, uh, bacterium, bacteria. Okay, so this shows, uh, this is figure 5-9 in your book. This shows the um, sort of a graphical representation of everything that we just said. So penetration, or excuse me, adsorption is where it sticks to the E. coli. Penetration, it injects its DNA into the um, host. And then this can go one of two ways. It can go into what's called the lysogenic state, which is where the DNA actually becomes part of the bacterial DNA. And then it just replicates along with the, the E. coli. And this can be good for the bacterium or it can be bad for the bacterium. Um, it just depends on what the DNA is and that it, um, whether it, it causes it to be more or less fit for its environment. So the other way it can go, though, is just like what we've talked about before, where it just starts to replicate itself, its own DNA, and then starts to produce all of the, the, the parts that it needs to become a, a new virion. So with, once we have all the parts, they self-assemble into new virions. Um, once they're mature virions, they begin to uh, release the enzymes that cause the uh, lysis of the E. coli cell, and the E. coli then explodes and releases the um, mature virions out to go and infect other cells. The life cycle of bacteriophage T2 begins with a bacteriophage particle binding to the surface of the bacterial cell. The phage particle injects its genetic material or DNA carried in the capsid of the bacteriophage into the host cell. Once inside the cytoplasm, genes in the phage DNA direct the degradation of the host cell DNA and are able to utilize proteins within the host cell for the synthesis of new T2 phages. First, many copies of the phage DNA are made. The phage DNA encodes the proteins which form the capsid and the regulatory proteins which direct their production and assembly into phage coats. The newly made capsid proteins and phage DNA molecules assemble into a new generation of phage particles and the cell is lysed, releasing the mature phage particles. All right, so when I was showing you that graphic um, in figure 5-9, I said that they can go into what is called the lysogenic um, state, depending on the virus. So let's talk about that a little bit. So it's called lysogeny, and there's different uh, back, uh, or viruses that do that. They're called um, temperate phages. And so, and remember lyse, of this word lysogeny means loosening or destruction. Um, so what they do is they become part of the DNA of the um, host and they are not replicated and, and produced and released immediately. So the viral DNA goes into what's called the prophage state and becomes part of the um, DNA of the bacteria bacterium, and we call this lysogeny or the lysogenic state. So this is just when the, the 
DNA of the virus is, is included in the um, host DNA. And so when the host bacterium replicates, and we'll talk about how that happens a little bit later, um, next chapter, um, but when it does that, it replicates the viral genetic material, well, DNA in this case, along with it. So uh, induction then can occur. So what happens is every so often, um, and I don't exactly know when and why and what the triggers are, um, I think sometimes it's a, uh, like they say, stress or whatever. I don't know. I mean, this is a bacterial infector. So something goes on in the environment of the bacterium or, or I don't exactly know. But what for whatever reason, this process called induction occurs and the virus becomes active again okay so the dna of the virus then is uh, cut out of the uh, host dna and goes directly into viral replication like we showed um, in steps three through six of that figure five nine so lysogeny is the least deadly form of this infection because this virus can replicate itself without killing the host cell and so it's more likely to continue to spread and because of that there are more bacteriophages than all other forms of life or I should say than the forms of life combined so one other interesting thing are these things called virophages in quotes because they haven't exactly decided what to call these things yet. At least not everybody agrees on it. Um, but these things, which were discovered back in 08, parasitize other viruses that are infecting the same host cell that they infect. So a virus infects a host, along comes another virus then the first virus infects the second virus, or maybe the other way around. When phage lambda infects E. coli, either the lytic or the lysogenic cycle may be followed. In both cases, the first step involves the phage attaching to the host cell and injecting its DNA into the host cell. In the lytic cycle, phage nucleic acid is replicated and phage genes are expressed resulting in production of phage proteins. Mature phage particles assemble and the host cell lysis, releasing the phage particles. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA is not replicated or transcribed. Instead, the phage DNA integrates into the host cell genome. The host cell can then replicate, carrying the integrated phage genome. The integrated DNA is referred to as prophage DNA, and the host cells carrying the prophage DNA are said to be in the lysogenic state. When the cells are exposed to ultraviolet light or to certain chemicals, phage induction occurs. The prophage DNA is excised and the phage enters the lytic cycle. All right, so I told you that these temperate phages infect bacteria, right? So, so why would we be concerned about that um, as a human? Well, here's why. If a bacterium is inside of a human, for example, E. coli, which lives in our colon, um, is infected with one of these temperate phages, what it can do is cause the release of toxins or enzymes that then make the human sick. Uh, this is called lysogenic conversion, which is uh, the it's I guess the conversion of the bacterium to a to a new type of bacterium that produces something. Um, different from what it produced before. So 
examples are uh, Carinobacterium diphtheriae, which causes the diphtheria toxin to be um, released, uh, Vibrio cholerae, which uh, produces the cholera toxin, Clostridium botulinum, which produces the botulinum toxin, which, which is botulism. Put the phases of the life cycle of animal viruses in correct order. So we start with adsorption, penetration, uncoating, synthesis, assembly, and release. Okay, so when we want to grow a virus in order to study it, it is not as simple as growing bacteria because the medium for viruses is a living host. Okay, so there's two basic methods that we use. The first one is called in vivo, which is uh, Latin for life. And this is where we actually use a living animal or an embryonic um, bird tissue, which is a fancy way of saying an egg, um, and actually put the virus inside of it because it, the, the egg has nutrients and enzymes and proteins and whatever is needed for the virus to grow. Uh, the other way is in vitro, which is where we don't have a living organism, but we have tissues or cells from a living organism that the, um, so for example, liver cells that we can, um, you know, you put hepatitis in to cause it to grow. So the basic reasons why we cultivate these viruses is to um, be able to isolate and identify these different viruses um, to, to, to inspect them um, or to prepare viruses for vaccines. It's very difficult to make vaccines in some cases because of trying to be able to make enough of these pieces and parts of the vaccine in order to, or of the virus in order to put it in the vaccine, you know, to inject you know, millions of people. And then the other reason is just to study them, to see how they live, um, look at their genetics and so on. So using live animals, they have uh, specifically bred uh, mice, rats, hamsters, and so on that they can use to, that, that apparently are easily infected with these uh, viruses so that they can create uh, more of them. Um, occasionally they'll use insects or other primates like uh, monkeys. And remember we talked about the specificity of the host. Um, so they'll ch choose um, a host that uh, replicates the, the virus very, very easily. So using a bird egg um, what's great about that is, is it, like I said, everything that's needed is all in one self-contained sterile unit um, because there should be no bacteria or anything inside of the egg. Um, they usually use chicken, duck, turkey eggs. So they actually drill a little hole in the egg and then inject the virus into it and then seal the hole back up. Um, so using cell cultures, they grow these cells in a petri dish instead of using an actual animal or an egg. So they grow them in sterile chambers, and that way they know that there's no contamination with bacteria. And what happens is the cells form a layer of cells that they call a monolayer. Mono just means one. So it's a single sheet that they can uh, then put the virus on and hopefully get the virus to infect. And what's great about the monolayer is that you can actually see through it. And so you can use a microscope to be able to inspect these viruses and to inspect um, the effects of the virus on the um, cell. 
so some practical application of what we just talked about. Um, they've been using eggs to manufacture flu vaccine since the 50s. Um, but if you remember anything in the news over the last few years, they were all concerned about the bird flu. And so when everybody went into a panic to try to uh, create vaccines for these, they decided they needed to find a better, more efficient method um, to do the replication. And so they've somehow figured out how to use the cells of dog kidneys to replicate this much more quickly. Um, and during the 09 bird flu epidemic, which never really was, um, there was at least one company that was doing it this way. Um, apparently there's some uh, fighting going on as to whether this should be allowed or not. And I, I don't know if it's because they haven't studied it enough or, or exactly what's going on. And quite certainly, whichever company figured out how to um, you, uh, use the dog kidney cells to do this has certainly patented the uh, method. So I'm sure no one else can use it. That way they can charge a whole bunch of money for it. So anyway. So how do we determine if they've been infected? Because the viruses are too small to see, right? Um, you can look at the effects, as I said, on the cells. Um, but you can also see these things called plaques. And plaques are areas in the culture where the DNA or where the cells have been um, where the cells have been killed. So they're just not there. So if you look at this, this shows a nice even uh, spread of cells, but over here there's these holes. Well, that's a plaque. That's where there are no host cells and they've been killed. So clear, well-defined patches on the sheet. And the other way is by looking at CPEs, looking at the actual cell and seeing what's happened to it. And this is the same method that they use to detect and count bacteriophages. So they just plate um, a layer of bacteria like E. coli, and um, infect it with these T. even uh, bacteriophages and um, s look for plaques and changes in the cells and so on. Um, the reason why these plaques are actually created is because the virus infects a cell and then it infects the adjacent cell and then the adjacent cell and it just starts to spread. So plaques, as you can see, are macroscopic, so they're actually big enough to see without a microscope uh, if you let them grow long enough. Uh, which of the following is not an in vivo method of culturing animal cells? So that would be a living thing, right? Uh, embryonated chicken eggs, guinea pigs, dog kidney cell culture, white mice, or all of the choices above are in vivo. And one of those is definitely not. Um, the dog kidney cell culture is not a living organism. It is uh, cells of a tissue. It's a culture. Okay, um, it is this chapter that we talk about these things. So I had mentioned earlier that there might be something smaller than viruses. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So be besides viruses, these are other non-cellular uh, infectious agents. So these things cause a group of diseases called spongiform encephalopathies. So let's look at that word for just a second. So form means form, spongy means sponge. Uh, which means it's sponge-like, and a sponge is porous, has holes in it, right? Um, in means in, cephal means head, and so if it's encephal, that means brain, and path means disease. So this causes some sort of a sponge-like uh, brain infection. So apparently these things are caused by these little things called prions. Um, 
which are small protein fibers. They don't have any nucleic acids, so there's no DNA or RNA, and they're much smaller and much simpler than viruses. Um, I think because of the size, these things are very uh, hard to study and understand, and so I don't think they exactly know exa uh, what happens and how they infect and, and the whole complete cycle of these. Um, but they are certainly implicated in chronic persistent diseases of humans and animals. And the reason why they, they're called this is because the brain tissue looks like a sponge um, when it's uh, inspected post-mortem. And one of the things that's bad about these is there's a really long period of latency before the first clinical signs appear. So it's difficult to detect whether or not something has been infected until it might be too late. And as you can imagine, if these things are infecting brain tissue, they would cause whatever would be affected if you damage your brain, right? So loss of muscle control, mental derangement, whatever. Um, they're progressive infections, meaning they just continue to get worse and worse and worse, and they will eventually kill you or whatever organism they are in. So apparently, too, there's some confusion about how these things propagate themselves because, as far as we know, everything else requires some sort of nucleic acid, DNA or RNA. So examples, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which causes mad cow disease. You probably remember that a few years ago. Um, over in Europe, they were having issues with mad cow disease, and then we, we weren't um, importing... European beef into the U.S. because um, we didn't want to want it to infect our cattle. And then what made it even worse is they dis they determined that humans could actually get this BSE after eating infected beef. And humans that got infected would develop a, a variant of the Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. So as of 2011. Um, only three cattle have been infected that they know of in the U.S. compared to close to 200,000 in the United Kingdom. So another uh, non-viral, non-cellular infectious agent are these things called, I shouldn't say non-viral, because um, they are viruses, but they're called satellite viruses. And these things depend on other viruses for replication. An example is um, these adeno-associated viruses. So the reason why it's called the adeno-associated virus is because originally they thought that it, it could only replicate in cells that were infected with the adenovirus. Since then, they've discovered that it can actually um, infect um, other cells infected with other viruses. Um, another example of a satellite virus is Delta agent, which is a naked circle of RNA and can only be expressed in the presence of hepatitis B virus. And what it does is it actually makes um, the hepatitis infection more damaging. So these satellite viruses, they're not exactly viruses per se. Um, so that's why they call them virus-like agents. Um, like the Delta agent it is a naked circle of RNA. So it's got the nuclear material of a virus, but it doesn't have all the rest of the structures of a virus. So another virus-like agent are these things called viroids, and they actually infect plants. They're only about the tenth of the size of a, of a normal virus. And just like the Delta agent, um, they're composed of naked strands of RNA. So there's no type of coating around it. So these things are economically significant because they damage massive amounts of crops of those things listed right there. But we're a lot less concerned with plant viruses in this class than we are human. So we'll move on. All right, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and BSE are caused by prions. Which of the following best describes a prion? Viral particle, naked DNA, infectious protein, a small bacterium, 
or a naked RNA. And as we said, it's a thread-like infectious protein. Okay, so let's apply this just a little bit here for a few slides. Uh, there's a whole bunch of infections of viruses all over the world every year, all right? Um, some of the common acute infections are just colds and what we call flus, right? Um, generally, colds and flus are not flu. The influenza virus is much more rare than people think. Um, I mean, it does happen. You know, certainly you know people who have had it, and it's possible you've even had it. But most of the time, what people call the flu is not influenza virus. Um, it's some sort of a, just a cold virus that causes what we call flu-like symptoms. Um, but hepatitis is a liver infection, chicken pox. Most of us have had that. That's becoming less common now that people are vaccinating their uh, children for chicken pox. My kids have not had the chicken pox yet and neither have been vaccinated. So that's a little concerning for me. Uh, herpes, warts is a human papillomavirus. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. Um, there are certain viruses that are more common in certain parts of the um, world. Uh, dengue fever, I think, is Mexico or South America. Rift River Valley, I believe, is in um, the Middle East. Uh, yellow fever. Um, certain viruses have super high mortality rates. Obviously, they don't all, or we would die of a cold, right? But rabies, AIDS, Ebola uh, quite commonly um, kill people. Um, AIDS was almost universally fatal um, until recently. Now, people with the drugs they have now can live pretty much a normal life almost, um, certainly to normal ages. Um, and I even have heard, I don't know if this was real or if something I saw on a TV show or what, but I think I heard that somebody has actually um, been cured of rabies, or not rabies, AIDS. Um, I could be wrong on that, though. Um, so viruses can cause long-term debility without death, such as polio or neonatal rubella, uh, which is a rubella infection of, a, of, a, of an infant. Um, there are viruses with possible connections to chronic diseases of unknown cause, such as type 1 diabetes, MS, um, certain cancers, um, Alzheimer's potentially, and, and, and maybe even obesity. So this table right here shows some uh, common uh, human viruses, um, gives the genus of them, and what the disease is called that they ca uh, cause. Um, certainly I'm not going to make you learn this, but this wouldn't be a bad reference material um, if you run into anything and need to look it up on here. Um, you should learn about the more important viruses and more common viruses in your pathology class when you get into that. All right, so how do we treat these infections? So antibiotics don't work. Okay, Antibiotics damage the cell wall of bacteria, but viruses don't have cell walls, and so they don't have any effect on them, right? So what we do... The antiviral drugs um, attempt to either block the, the viral replication by disrupting one of the steps in the process of um, the replication of the virus um, or other things. Um, they can have some significant side effects on humans. However, um, there is a a chemical that is uh, produced in the human cell. If a cell gets uh, infected with a virus, it begins to create in, in, uh, this chemical called interferon. And what that does is it causes the cell to, to not replicate. And I believe it also causes the cell to actually um, self-destruct. Okay, And so they're trying to use this thing artificially um, to treat viral infections. I don't know how effective it is. Um, it might be effective more in other viruses than, than some. Um, DRACO, which is an acronym for 
double stranded RNA activated caspase oligomizer, not capsase, but caspase. Um, as a little side note, caspase is cysteine aspartic protease or cysteine dependent aspartate directed proteases. They are these uh, proteases, which is an enzyme that damages proteins um, that, that apparently causes um, what we call apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So this, our cells will actually kill themselves at some point uh, for different reasons. Anyway, so they're trying to use this to cause these virus infected cells to self-destruct. Um, so anyway, this Draco was is an antiviral drug that's de that was developed in 2011, and just like I said, causes them to kill themselves. But I don't think it's been FDA approved yet, but I'm not sure about that. All right, antibiotics are an effective method for treating viral infections, true or false? And of course, the answer is false because they damage the cell walls of prokaryote. They don't have any effect on viruses. And that is the end of chapter five. Please study.